so good to have you guys joining us for this Easter celebration. I didn't realize how many of you were here. I was sitting down here with my wife and, and facing this way, and I knew there were about a dozen folks here and a few on the uh, track here, but I'm so glad you guys have joined us. This is my favorite day of the year. Not just favorite holiday, it's my favorite day of the year. I, no, don't get me wrong, I, I love Christmas, everything about Christmas, I love that. I love all the family birthdays, I, and I treasure and reason my anniversary. But this is my favorite day of the entire year, the day we celebrate Jesus' resurrection. The last three or four days have been busy and full, but I have, I have sensed this joy that just, just keeps bubbling up again and again. And it's simply because the clarity, the focus we have, that Jesus Christ has risen from the dead. So I want to take this slide. I want to tell you my favorite Easter story. It's my favorite Easter story because I can identify with it at some key places. And, and truth is, though I don't know a lot of you, you'll be able to identify with it as well at the same time. It's a true story. You can find it in Luke chapter 24, beginning in verse 13. The setting is the very first Easter. It's about mid-afternoon of the very first Easter. There are these two men that have set off on this seven-mile walk from Jerusalem to Emmaus, which is their hometown. If you could see them, if you could, if you could sense what was going on inside of them, you would see these sagging shoulders. You would see their faces shrouded in sadness. You would see no, no uh, gate, no, nothing in their steps, just exhaust and weariness about them. You see, they had been followers of Jesus, not just on the periphery, not yet quite the inner circle of the 12, but probably just beyond the 12. They had been close followers of Jesus for a long, long time. They had walked with him. They had heard his teaching. They had seen his miracles. In fact, they would say he was a mighty teacher. And I wonder if, he, if they were there on that day when he gave that most famous of all sermons of all time, the Sermon on the Mount, if they heard him talk about the Beatitudes beginning with saying, blessed are the poor in spirit, for they will inherit the very kingdom of God. If they would hear him in that same setting give this golden rule, do unto others as you would have them do unto you. I wonder if they would hear him on that day, teach him how to pray. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. I wonder if he would hear them say, don't worry about food and clothes and stuff. He said, if you would just pursue the kingdom of God and righteousness, God will give you all of the other stuff as well. At the end of that message, he would say to them very profoundly, build your house on a rock. Don't build it on sand because the storm will come. And we know about storms in the Bay Area, don't we? The storm will come. The rains will come. If you build on sand, it'll wash your house away. If you build on the rock, it will never be washed away. He was talking about much more in the houses, wasn't he, on that day? The greatest sermon ever preached. I wonder if they were there that day. Maybe the day he talked about the prodigal son, about this son who had, had so disrespected his father and said, hey, dad, I, I can't wait for you to die. I, I, want, I want my half of the money now. You're not dying quick enough for me. And the father, for some reason, gave it to the son. He went out and squandered it on the worst, the worst of sins until it was all gone. And then a depression hits and he's finding himself uh, trying to find labor and he's working at a pigsty. And he finally realizes if I, if I go back... If I go back crawling on my knees to my father and just beg to be a hired servant, maybe in his grace, because he's a very graceful man, maybe he'll take me back. And so he gets up his courage, he makes this long trek back home, and, and as, he, as he, he's approaching, he's formed the words about begging forgiveness and saying how sorry he is and begging to be a slave. And he can glimpse up on the family porch, and he wouldn't know this, but every single morning, every single sunrise, Jesus would say, the father's been on the porch with every sunrise. He's been gazing down the road, hoping this is the day the son comes home. The son looks up, and there's the dad on the distance on the porch, and all of a sudden, the dad leaps off the porch and, and runs to embrace his son who had you know, run so far from home. And the son says, Dad, I'm so sorry. I'm so sorry. He can't even get out the words. Please just let me be a slave. Let me be a slave to you. The father embraces him and kisses him and hugs him and takes him back to the house and, and has this huge party. In their time, the words were, he killed the fatted calf. I mean, the ultimate party for this son who had gone so far from the father. Maybe they were there that day hearing Jesus say, this is the love and grace of God the Father. Maybe they heard him teach. They said he was a mighty teacher. The years they followed him, they said he did powerful miracles. And I wonder if they were there on that day when there were 5,000 men alone on the hillside, plus women and children. 
if you've been in church for a while, there are 5,000 men. There are probably 15,000 women there and a bunch of children as well. So there were a bunch of people there, a bunch of people. They hadn't come prepared to eat a meal, and Jesus taught on and on and on, and they're all hungry. They're all famished. There's no food except there's one basket of food. Maybe they were there watching. Jesus takes this one basket with five small loaves and two small fish. He begins to multiply it until all 5,000 men and all the women and all the kids ate to the, until they were full. And then they picked up 12 baskets full of food left over. Maybe they were there that day and saw the miracle. Maybe they were there the day that the man who had been blind from birth, Jesus gave him sight in a heartbeat at the pool of Siloam. Maybe they were there when the man who had been unable to walk for 38 years, Jesus gave him the ability to walk in a heartbeat at the pool of Bethesda. Maybe they were there when there were the 10 men, skin and life ravaged by leprosy, and Jesus cured them in a moment. They said he was a man that did powerful miracles. And yet on the previous Sunday, just one week before, they were certain he was the Messiah. In fact, they were certain that was when he would be crowned Messiah and his eternal reign would begin. It was seven days before this journey to Emmaus. Word had reached Jerusalem that Jesus was coming into town down from the Mount of Olives. And multitudes streamed out to meet him, probably thousands. They took out these palm fronds and they were worshiping, waving them in the air. Men and women would take off their coats and cloaks and lay them before Jesus as he came down on a donkey. And they were worshiping, singing, praise be to the King of Israel. They were declaring him the Messiah. Just seven days before, these two men were certain this would be the beginning of the messianic reign that would never end. Seven days before, but then Monday happened. And the anger and resistance of the priest and the religious leaders stiffened became worse on Tuesday and worse on Wednesday and so on on Thursday. And they woke up Friday morning just two days before this journey to find that Jesus had been arrested during the night, been put through the mockery of a trial, had been beaten, was condemned to crucifixion at 9 a.m. that morning. Likely they were there on Golgotha, which means Skull Hill. Likely they were there at 9 a.m., Piercing the air, they could hear the sound of steel on steel, such hammer driving stakes through Jesus' hands and feet. Likely they stood there for six long, tortuous hours, hope draining out of them until he breathed his last and died. No breath left. He was dead. 3 p.m. in the afternoon, all hopes dashed. They thought he was the Messiah. I understand they couldn't gather themselves, it appears, to walk the seven miles then. It was almost sundown. Sundown would be the beginning of Sabbath. As Jews, they couldn't travel on Sabbath day, so they stayed. They stayed the night. They stayed all the next day, which was Saturday, which was Sabbath. They stayed. Can you imagine how they felt? Can you imagine the grief? Every bit of hope drained from them. They got up Sunday morning likely planning to make the seven-mile trip back to Emmaus. The word came to them from some of the women in their group. They said, we've been to his tomb, and the tomb's empty. And we saw some angels, and they said he's risen from the dead. So some, some of the disciples went back, and they saw the tomb empty. They came back and said, yeah, the tomb's empty. That's all we saw. And so these two men, it looks like they lingered for four or five hours. Maybe there was hope initially. Maybe the angels appeared. Maybe it's true. Maybe he's risen. But as four or five hours passed, all hope was drained again. You know why I know? Because they picked up their bags. They began to walk to Emmaus. They weren't sticking around Jerusalem. There was nothing there for them. Shoulders sagging. Faces shrouded in sadness. No spring in their steps. Walking to Emmaus. Lost in their thoughts, lost in their conversation, they suddenly realize that, that a third man has joined with them, is walking beside them. And it tells us, we know from reading this, it tells it's Jesus that says God kept them from recognizing him. And so there's this conversation that goes on, and, and they seem to think that Jesus doesn't know what happened. And so he inquires about the week, and, and they begin to tell him, and they say, there was this man named Jesus, and he was a mighty teacher. He did powerful miracles, and we thought, we hoped he was the Messiah. But the religious leaders didn't care for him very much, had him arrested and had him crucified. And, and, and yet even now, some of our closest friends have been to the tomb and said, it's empty. They said they saw angels and said he's resurrected. And they don't say any more. But their steps say everything. They're walking away from Jerusalem. There's no hope there. Jesus says to them, 
why is it so hard for you to believe everything the prophets predicted about the Messiah in scriptures? Don't you realize the scriptures talk about all the Messiah must suffer? And then it says he began to, to tell them from the writings of Moses, which is the first five books of the Old Testament, through, it says through all of the prophets. Friends, there are 17 books of prophecy. Many scholars think he taught, he taught them through all 17 books plus the writings of Moses. And I'm not sure what all he covered, but apparently it took some two hours or so to cover all that. But I feel sure that he covered Isaiah 53. There's this entire chapter in Isaiah, Isaiah 53. It's all about Jesus, what would happen to him. And you read it now, and you look back and go, it is the script. It is the script of what happened to Jesus, the Messiah. And I bet he ended with Malachi chapter 4, which is the very last chapter of the Old Testament. Just five verses from the end, the verse says that, that when the Son of Righteousness has risen with healing in his wings, you will go forth filled with joy, just like calves let out to pasture. When the Son of Righteousness rises with healing in his wings, you'll be filled with joy. I think he ended there. By then they had arrived at Emmaus. It was, this, it was the destination for the two men. Jesus is going to go on, but the two men did something that would change everything about the rest of their lives. It would change their eternity. The two men said, please come in. The two men invited him in for a meal and to spend the night with him that night. So Jesus comes into their house and the food is prepared and it's put out and Jesus blesses the food breaks the bread, and God pulls back the curtain, and they see it's Jesus, it's the risen Messiah. They see he is risen from the dead. And in that moment, he vanishes right, from, right before them. The two men said, didn't our hearts catch fire on the road? When he talked about the scriptures and the Messiah, didn't our hearts catch fire? They had seen him, he was risen, and they had to tell somebody. It says within the hour they were on the road back again. By now it's dark, it's dangerous. It's seven miles still, they're on the road back again. This time shoulders back, faces radiant, spring in their stride, going back. They cover the seven miles quickly. They find the disciples and some other followers. They burst in to tell them. Before they can get a word out, someone says, Jesus is alive. Peter's seen him. And then they tell their story of seeing Jesus. And as they're telling the story, Jesus himself appears again right there in their midst. I read that story again and again and again. And I realize that how different their lives would have been had they not invited Jesus in. They could have spent the entire walk, the entire journey, the entire seven miles walking with Jesus. He was right beside them. But think about the difference if they had not invited him in, in to have a meal with them, in to stay with them. The difference it made in their lives, they invited Jesus in. And I think about the parallels to my life, and though I don't know many of you, these are the same parallels to your life as well. Scripture says, and maybe you know this already, maybe you know and believe this, Scripture says that God created you, but very specifically that both God the Father and Jesus God the Son co-created you. Colossians chapter 1, God the Father and Jesus Son co-created you. From the moment of your creation, Jesus was right beside you. I mean, the, the time you spent in your mother's womb, he was right beside you. When you were born from that moment forward, he, he's been beside you ever since that time. Every step you've taken, every time you've laid down, every time you've sat, every meal you've eaten, at your best moments, he's been there. At your worst moments, he's been there. The times you're most proud of, he's been there. The times you're most ashamed of, he's been there. The highs and lows, the ups and downs, everything, he's been there every single step of the way, filled with love for you, filled with love for me. In fact, what he yearns to do, in fact, the reason he died on that cross in those six hours, the reason he died, what he yearns to do is to forgive every single sin of mine and yours. And not just that, he yearns to change your life and mine, to make us increasingly like him. And not only that, he yearns to give us a new eternal address, an eternal address to heaven. He yearns to do all those things, but we get none of those while he's walking beside us. He's filled with love. He's step by step. Every single moment of your breathing, waking, sleeping time, he's right beside you. We get none of that as he's beside us. We don't get forgiveness. We don't get made into a new person. We don't get a change of eternal address. Until we do what those two men, until we invite him in to our lives. Specifically invite him in to be the Lord and Savior of our lives. 
to be clear about what that means to be the Lord of one's life means to be the leader of one's life. It means you and I would say to him, I'm surrendering, I'm surrendering leadership to your leadership. I want you to be the Lord of my life, the leader of my life. To be Savior means to be the forgiver of all of one's sins. It means to say, you're the one who can forgive me and wants to and has waited to forgive me all of my sins. And when you and I say to him, please come in as Lord and Savior, he moves from being beside you, it says, to living within you, to being inside you. In such proximity, the best description that the scripture gives is he, he now lives in you. Every sin forgiven begins to remold you into a new person as he leads you in a fresh way. Change of eternal address. All of that happens. All that happens. Walking beside you, walking beside you until the day comes that you say, would you please come in and be the Lord and Savior of my life? And all of that begins to change. I have a dear, dear friend. Many of you know him, Dana Aronson. Dana says when he, on September the 8th, 1998, when he said to Jesus, would you be, please become the leader and forgiver of my life? He says now he can look back to all those previous 37 years and again and again he sees where God, Jesus was there walking beside him all of that time. He says there was a time as a freshman in college, first semester of college, he gets this assignment. It's an odd assignment if you ask me for college. I don't think you get it much anymore, but the assignment was write down if you, what you believe about God. Does he exist? Does he not exist? Just write down an essay of what you believe about God. And so Dana says he was writing down with much passion. It's not possible that there's a God because of this tragedy that I've witnessed. There cannot be a God because of this difficulty, this, this struggle, this hard time, on and on and on. He got near the end of his essay, all these reasons why there simply can't be a God, and he realizes he was writing inside. He was raging and cursing with profanity, with arm raised at a God in heaven. And suddenly he realized, as he's writing, he said, you know, as I'm writing this, I realize I'm so angry at God, and I think... He must actually exist. But Dana says, but I didn't invite him in then. I just kept on going. A year or so passed, and it's late one night, and he gets a phone call. The phone call says that his best friend has been in a bad auto accident an hour and a half away. Dana grabs another friend, and they drive an hour and a half to the hospital. They walk in to find out that his best friend has died in that accident. The friend's parents are there spends some time with the parents, and then they begin this long hour and a half journey back in the middle of the night. Dana says it was, it was so cloud. The clouds were so thick, it was pitch black. It's a two-lane road. There no farmhouses. There's nothing. It's just pitch black. And he said, all of a sudden, the clouds entirely parted, and there's this moon that shone so brightly, it fully illuminated the entire inside of the vehicle. It illuminated everything all around, all the countryside. It was this brilliant illumination now. For a few seconds, then all closed back again. And he said, I felt something stir within me. He said, looking back, it was God. But he said, but I didn't invite him in then. And then Dana said, when there was something even more difficult, most difficult time of my life that came way down the road. That was the time that I had looked enough, I would searched enough, I thought enough, and I thought, I believe he's really there. I believe that Jesus actually is beside me. I believe he actually has nail-scarred hands and feet. I believe he died for my sins. I believe he'll lead me. Then he says, on that night, September the 8th, he said, I said to Jesus, please be the Lord and Savior of my life. And then he says, he went from being beside me to being in me. He says, everything's changed. Everything has changed. When you or I invite Jesus in and we realize he's risen from the dead, just like those two men on the road to Emmaus, we have to tell somebody. Hey, it just There's something that just surges within you. You have to tell somebody. I, I, I asked Jesus to come into my life when I was in the middle of a corporate retreat for leaders in the corporation I was in. It was intense training. They brought in leaders, people who they hoped would lead the company forward. And intense training and it's a five-day deal. On Wednesday night, I'm, I'm out on the hillside because I've been around some people that believe Jesus was alive for a while. Marie and I have been around them for a while. I actually didn't know at that time that seven days earlier, my wife, Marie, had actually said to Jesus, would you please become the leader and forgiver of my life? I didn't know that yet. But on that Wednesday night on this hillside in Pennsylvania, I came to a point of saying, you know, I believe this is all true about you, Jesus. Like, would you be the Lord and Savior of my life? Would you, 
would you come live within me as well? For the first time in my adult life, I felt peace to the depths and core of my being for the very first time. I woke up the next day with all these maybe 20 other corporate leaders and I wanted to tell them. And, but I was afraid to. It wasn't because I hadn't heard God's name used. I'd actually heard it used quite a few times in that retreat. And I heard Jesus Christ used a few times too, but it wasn't used in the way I would use it. And so I was afraid to tell them, and I was still stuck in this corporate world, and I was still hoping that, you know, I could get along and climb the ladder and all that stuff and everything. So I went all day, Thursday, I was just, I was bursting, and I kept it all in. I didn't tell a single soul. I was going to make it to the end of the retreat. On Friday morning, we wake up, the retreat's going to be over, I'll get out of there, and I can go tell somebody else. What I didn't know was the end of the retreat was we all get in a circle and and we're asked to tell what would be different about our lives going forward because we had been there. And I thought, oh no. And so someone begins, as we're going around the circle person by person, and someone begins, and there's this great deal. The money's gonna, company's going to make more money because of the change that, in that person's life. Everyone nods their heads, they clap, there's this applause. Next person, there's something else, some change in his life, and it's going to make more money for the corporation. And everyone nods their head, there's this clap, there's this applause. So there's three or four of those, and it comes to me. And I said, well, this is what's going to be different about me. On Wednesday night on that hillside out there, I came to believe that Jesus Christ is risen from the dead. And I asked him to be the Lord and Savior of my life. And friends, you could have heard a pin drop. There was this long, long silence. Finally, the next man in line said, well, what I was about to say doesn't seem very significant anymore at this point. You have to tell somebody. You have to tell somebody. Sometime after that, I was, um, it was Easter season. It was this time of year. It was Easter season. And I was on my way home, I I asked him if I could pick up some food for us. And I went by a Taco Bell to get some tacos. And so I'm at this Taco Bell window and I order my tacos. And and the girl in the window uh, says, you you are really happy. I mean, what is making you so happy? So I told her. I said, I know Jesus. He's risen from the dead. So she closes the window and turns around and walks away. And I thought, oh, man. I'm not even going to get my tacos. And so I'm just, I'm sitting there at the wheel just thinking, what am I going to do now? I've got to find another fast food place and everything. And about that time, the window opens up. And now there are five faces in the window. She says, I brought my, all of my coworkers here. Will you tell them what you told me? I got to tell all, all of them. You asked me what makes me so happy. And I know Jesus. He's risen from the dead. You have to tell somebody. So I've thought about this moment right now, I, I understand, please understand with me, every one of us walked into the stadium, either with Jesus beside us or inside of us. It just two ways we walked in. I mean, you either walked in with Jesus right beside you where he's been all of your life, right beside you, all of his love, all of his grace, all his longing to forgive your sins and lead your life and change your eternal lives, all of that, he's walked in beside you, or you walked in with him inside you. And you know he's risen. You know your sins have been forgiven. You know he's changing. You know your eternal address is heaven. You walked with him in with him inside you. And I want to say this. If you walked in with him beside you, he gives this profound invitation. It's near the very end of scripture. It's Revelation 3.20. He says, look, I stand at the door and knock. If you hear my voice and open the door, I will come in and we will have a meal together as friends. And he's saying that to you now. If you walked in with him beside you, he's saying this to you now. I'm I'm knocking at the door of your heart and mind and soul right now. If you'll invite me in as Lord and Savior, I will come in. We will begin this life of fellowship together. I will come in. And I don't know, you may have a lot more chances to invite him in. This may not be the only chance you have. You may have a lot better chance. You may have a lot better preacher someday that gives you an invitation. I don't know. But you don't know either if you're going to have more chances than this. But I know you have this chance now. Heck, on this Easter morning, when there's this crowd of people around us celebrating that Jesus is risen, he's knocking on the door of your heart and mind and soul. Say, if you hear my voice knocking, if you hear my voice and open the door, I will come in. And I will sit down with you and we'll have a meal together. And we will begin life together. As simple as a prayer saying, Jesus, I believe you've risen Please come in as my Lord and my Savior. 
What would keep you from doing that? What better offer do you have? What better life plan do you have? What are you going to do to, to change the course and direction of your life now for a better plan? What better offer will you ever have than his offer? Say, if you hear my voice, hear my knock, invite me in as Lord and Savior, and I will come in, and we will have fellowship together. Every single sin forgiven, new life with him shaping and molding you, eternal address of heaven. What would keep you from saying yes to him? Would you bow with me? I'm going to pray. And when I pray, you know if you walked in with him beside you and not inside you. When I pray, I hope you would take this time and you would have this quiet and silent prayer with, with Jesus. And in this time of prayer, you would have your own prayer and you would say to him, I, I choose to believe you're alive. I choose to recognize what those two men recognized 2,000 years ago when they arrived in Emmaus. I choose to recognize what that guy with the microphone recognized. I choose to recognize you're alive, Jesus. And I want to invite you in to be my Lord and my Savior. And Lord, as there are people around this room praying, perhaps many praying, please come in. Please be my Lord. Please be my Savior. Many around this room praying, thank you, Jesus, that, that you showed yourself to me long ago. Thank you for forgiving my sins, for leading my life, for giving me the eternal address of heaven. Many, many prayers of those. I pray that Jesus says only you can do. You make every heart aware that you're here and you're risen with healing in your wings when we begin to follow you follow your lead that's the source of joy that's the very source of joy so Jesus you have risen from the dead and we're going to begin now to once again to worship and to celebrate and lift our hearts and our voices to you for you are the risen king I pray all this in Jesus mighty name amen